Welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for being here. Um, today's session will run uh, a fund called the Deep Tech Seed Fund. And we are specifically interested in ventures that are coming out of science. So we, we get involved kind of unusually early for a, for a venture capital uh, uh, firm. And, um, you know, a, a little bit of history. So I've been involved in a whole bunch of uh, startups and several of which were university oriented. But my last venture was uh, exceptional in that we had a really bold claim. The what, what we, It was a semiconductor venture. And when we approached all the memory companies and told them what it was we thought that we were able to do, they were all immediately really interested. And before we even left the university, we had three of them uh, paying us 30 grand each for a, for a pilot of, of the activity. So, so after that, you know, I'd never seen anything like that before. And after that, I said, OK, let's create a fund that looks for ventures like that, looks for ventures where there is a really outstanding, where there is a claim that gets people really excited from the, from the very beginning. And so we set up Deep Tech Seed Fund. But when we went looking for ventures, we quickly found that it was really hard to find uh, ventures like that. And it's not that there is, it, it's not that there isn't amazing science going on all over Europe. It's just that most of the incubator programs and sort of development programs don't actually do a good enough job of going out to the market and saying, hey, look, these guys have created this thing. Are you interested? And doing that in some kind of a way that, that allows them to impress investors. So we did a lot of work and we've been doing a lot of work over the last couple of years with Deep Tech Founders here uh, and notably with the, the different programs run by Innovate UK in the, in the UK. And so I'm very excited to, we're actually using today and yesterday to launch uh, this. And, and, and that's why I want questions at the end, because we're actually going to use this recording to sort of promote this uh, concept a little bit. So, because what, what we've done is, by working with these programs over the last couple of years, we have gone from, we started with a simple investment thesis, which was, okay, let's go and find stuff where, where the market is really excited about the claim. But we realized that there's actually a couple of other kind of, characteristics of ventures that need to be in place in order for them to function as ventures at all. And these are these are not obvious, and they're, they're not obvious to most people. Uh, most sort of seed stage investors who aren't specialized in deep tech or aren't specialized in research, you know, are not familiar with them. And a lot of other investors simply won't even look at this space because they have looked and they've found these kind of problems around cap table and ownership and stuff like this that, that, that really kind of bedevil uh, the early stage ventures. So, so what we've come up with uh, and what we're now sort of creating a community around is a scorecard, which is basically saying, OK, look, you know, you've got this amazing science. That's kind of a given. You've got all this public funding. Now you're going out to actually uh, raise money. Uh, but there's actually a set of things that you can present uh, that allows you to tell serious investors, not just sort of, you know, crazy early stage investors or government investors like BPE, uh, but actually say, no, no, look, we really do have something special. So we've come up with a scorecard, which is uh, intended to give you a way to credibly present your venture in a way that will have a bunch of later stage investors who wouldn't otherwise normally look at science-based ventures. And we're building a community around this. So we have a number of uh, incubators going live with it, uh, uh, Deep, uh, Deep Tech Founders today and uh, the iCure, one of the iCure uh, ventures or, or incubators in the UK yesterday. Um, and we also have a big bunch of uh, investors, mostly later stage investors, who are saying, OK, if these guys can actually populate that scorecard, then we will look at them. Uh, and that's really important because a lot of you, are, a lot of your ventures, you know, if you're successful, will ultimately need a lot of money, not just sort of small money that seed investors can provide. But you need a way to actually bring your venture to the attention of later stage specialist investors. So, so today I'm going to talk you through, uh, I'm going to talk you through the scorecard. And in so doing, and as we have said, for many of you, this is your first kind of you're you're just at the beginning of your, your your venture journey, and many of you will have had a background in you know research, and you'll be familiar with research funding and grant funding and so on. So today I'm going to sort of explain the scorecard, but in so doing, I'm going to try to explain to you, I suppose, the key things you, that you need to show about your spin out, about your venture, uh, that will be in many cases things that you've not considered that you needed to demonstrate before. Uh, so, uh, so that's really that's what I'm going to cover today. So, I'm about to share my screen. So, if you bear with me for a moment, uh, bum, 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 bum. sure. Okay. So, hopefully, you can all see a screen that says the problem at the top. Okay, good. <clears throat> so, 
so I've, I've just got a couple of slides and then I go into the detail. Uh, so the problem basically is that, you know, no matter how good the research is, no matter how global a problem you're solving and cool research, it is actually quite difficult to, to spin out a company. The vast majority of research that is done around the world just goes nowhere. You know, they present a couple of papers, maybe they file a patent or something, uh, but most of it just goes nowhere. Um, you know, it never turns into a, a commercial venture. Very often it isn't implemented or maybe it's implemented by somebody else who copied it. Uh, so it, it's quite difficult. Uh, you know, the good science on its own isn't enough. You have to, you, you, and the problem from an investment point of view is there's actually a very big credibility gap because the experience of so many investors in trying to invest in science has been really bad. Uh, so you actually need to do something to say, no, 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 I'm actually one of the special ones. You know, you, you, you just rocking up saying, hey, I've got cool science or I'm, you know, there's this huge disease I'm going to, you know, cure or whatever. It is not enough. And it, it, it's it's really not enough uh, because, as I say, the experience generally has been that um, the, the, the experience variously has been uh, that, you know, the the. Uh, researchers are delusional. You know, they, they think they're solving a big problem, but they're not. Or they're the only ones who think that's they're solving that problem. They can't persuade anybody else that they've actually solved it. Uh, or else if they actually do get money and they run a company, they're just completely unable to run a company. And, you know, the thing goes, goes bust. Or there's some crazy situation where the professor who is staying in the university and has no intention of doing much with the venture expects to own the vast majority of the venture or the university has some crazy terms where it's expecting to own like the majority of the venture in some non-dilutive way. So there's a whole bunch of things that are that have been problems, uh, persistent problems with, with university commercialization. But the big one that is usually missing is the idea of the uh, inventor being able to say, Yes, I'm solving a big. I'm solving a big problem, and, and these guys agree with me. And these guys are willing to actually commit money to to prove that they agree agree to agree with me. Maybe it's a you know a big life sciences company that's willing to invest in this trial stage, or you know, or maybe it's a, a huge patient group that's going to provide facilities for for a trial, or it's an early adopter industrial customer who's actually going to pay for a trial. So 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 like you you have to actually. You get beyond the the sort of the idea. I uh, think you have to actually show that there is something real out there, and then you also, and this is a really non non trivial problem for many science based ventures. You actually have to have the bones of a team. You don't necessarily need to have a complete, you know, commercial every part of the team, but you certainly need to have enough people to 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 execute on that next stage, which is very often still a technical stage. But you need a team that is willing to work full time in the venture and commit uh, uh, commit. Uh, commit to the venture so uh let me try to go to my next slide slide presenting in excel this is kind of old school but here we go so <clears throat> the reason uh you know i suppose like why are we here why are we talking about this um the you know and you may say especially in france you may say well you know why is this guy talking about you know I, i'm in university and i know that i can get a big grant or, you know, some level of investment from BP or from a fund that is connected with my university, I know that there is a funding program that is available to me at the next stage. And that is true. And it is true, actually. I mean, actually, in France, it's most true. The, the, the funding climate for science-based ventures, early stage science-based ventures in France is particularly generous. But in most European countries, it's pretty good as well. Uh, and it's partly good because the governments have said, well, there's a real problem uh, investing, finding investment for early stage science ventures. So we'll we'll create a fund or we'll provide grant funding. So so they've actually fixed the problem a little bit too well in many cases. And what ends up happening is that the uh, researchers get that sort of easy funding early on. And then when they go to the next round to, to actually raise money, which has to be pretty much completely commercial, the commercial guys look at them and say, well, what the hell is this? This is just some science project. Where's the business? You know, what have you done about you know, commercial development? So so, <clears throat> so you actually, to, to be successful, to survive, you actually need to start thinking about the really hard commercial tests as early as you can. Uh, because, you know, it's not, you can't, you know, use early stage, you can't use sort of government backed seed money to do more science and then figure out, okay, we'll, we'll do the commercial stuff. The commercial stuff actually takes a long time. You know, you need, it often takes over a year to build credibility with your sort of early adopter uh, customers. And in mo most of your ventures, most deep tech ventures are, are business to business and it's a long sales cycle. So you have to kind of actually start this stuff really early on. And the other sort of, uh, uh, the you know, the other issue is like, 
in most cases uh, for deep tech ventures, I mean, a lot of deep tech ventures need sort of tens and twenties and thirties of millions relatively early in their development. And that kind of money only comes from specialist investors. You know, they, if, if you've got some amazing new construction material or something and you're going to need 10 or 20 million, you're not talking about generalist VCs at all. You're talking about specialist ones who understand the, 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 the background and who can write those kind of big checks. And most of those specialist guys don't go near the seed stage because they just there's no efficient way for them to engage with it it's just they just see too much noise too many hopeless ventures so they kind of they, they sort of wait they sort of have a survivor bias thing where they wait for the people who who've got to that later stage and, and survived and, but at the same time most of them will tell you and they've told me and, and we're very active with a bunch of them because most of them actually want to see stuff really early because it's often of strategic interest to them a lot of them are companies and they're they're trying to invest in things that are going to be strategically interested for the, those companies. So so you know if you can actually present yourself in a credible way uh, very early, it is actually possible to engage with investors that most people would consider only later stage investors. So so the scorecard that we're I'm presenting today is partly a tool to allow you to actually say no 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 I'm for real. And. Um, uh, I lost my last point. Be to show how to. Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah. So that's the idea. So, so I, I'm going to try and uh, uh, sh show you show you that. The other outcome from a scorecard like this, and this is uh, this is a kind of a byproduct which the uh, which the Innovate UK is a funding body. They they're like BP, and they give out grants, and they're actually using our scorecard partly to help them identify things that are just completely unviable, uh, like rather than sort of waste government money on on grants. You know, so so this this kind of approach can also apply some tests that tell you actually there's no hope. There's, there's some problems with your venture that are just they seem unfixable. So it actually works at both ends. It works to sort of uh, to highlight ones that are really exceptional. It also works to sort of uh, highlight ones that are completely un unviable. So so let me get into the detail. Okay, so and uh, I'll circulate this uh, spreadsheet afterwards uh, via Huyam uh, and the guys. So the 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 first thing, uh, and this is really dry. Okay, I, I'm apologies for the lack of graphics, but there's a kind of brutality to the venture business that this this sort of bold numerical presentation gets across. Uh, evidence of traction. So let's go through this line by line. So you know, the first question is, you know, I I am out there and I'm saying, well, you know, I've got this amazing new material. Uh, I'm really excited about it, uh, and you know, uh, yes. Uh, and my cousin who runs a construction company down the, the road said they're very excited about it too. You know, so I've spoken to one, uh, you know, one company in my home market. Uh, like that's really weak corroboration. You need to kind of go out, like, like first of all, all um, deep tech ventures should be thinking global. Like I, 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 you are running, you are all thinking about creating an intellectual property-based uh, venture. And intellectual property markets are global you know nobody's using the who has the fifth best iphone or mobile phone in your pocket uh you know you don't have the sort of you're not you don't go home and watch tv uh, that is based on a display technology that is this the sixth or the seventh or even like it's not the best in france it's like one of the best in the world uh so so you need to if you're if you're going out to investors ultimately saying uh, look, my my science is is actually great. It's going to be the, the, the it's going to be the basis for a really strong venture. You need to actually go out and test that uh, quite widely in as many countries as you reasonably can. And it is it is not difficult to do that. And there's a number of talks I've given uh, at Deep Tech uh, Deep Tech uh, Founders and elsewhere, which uh, I'll, I'll provide a link to as well, which will sort of tell you a little bit about how to do this. So it's quite possible to do that, you know, even with with minimal resources. And it's actually increasingly easy to do that. Because of some of the uh, tools available at LinkedIn and elsewhere, so so you need to sort of so first of all, you know, you need to actually have gone out and asked. And if you really haven't asked, then you're really not taking this seriously at all. Like if you're saying, well, you know, and for example, as an investor, I've heard this more than once, and I try not to kind of, I try not to laugh at the people when they say it to me. It's some, and it goes something like this: Yes, yes, we need we need a million we need a million euro so we can develop a product. Uh, you know, and and yes, when we have spent your million euro, then we will go and ask people if they like it. We can't possibly go and ask them now because we haven't got the product yet. And like that's just you know, it's it, pe people under scientists, uh, tech people with technical backgrounds, and I am one of those. Um, you know, have a, a, a an incorrect idea that you know they need to, they cannot ask, uh, they sorry, they cannot do a sort of hypothetical sell, which is like, look, I think I can do this thing. 
uh, would you be interested? But in, and in fact, for most of you, it's, it's, it's actually much better than that. Most of you feel you have some kind of scientific breakthrough. And whilst you're not at the product stage yet, you know, you still should have something that gives you to believe that you have an edge uh, globally. Um, you know, you, you have achieved something in the lab which nobody else has achieved. So it's a case of you coming up with a, a proposition that says, look, you know, I've achieved, uh, I, I've demonstrated at sort of the scale of, you know, five grams or 10 grams that I can create this material that has this incredible tensile strength. Um, and, you know, I'm pretty confident that nobody else has done this. And I believe it's highly applicable to your industry. And the people in that industry will have a very well-informed view as to the state of the art typically and, and what's possible. And if you're on the right track, they will say to you, OK, if you can prove that to me at kilogram scale, then, yes, I'm definitely interested. And in fact, I will actually give you some money towards your efforts to prove it at, at that level. You can certainly ask, ask for money. Uh, and it's surprisingly easy to get money, uh, you know, when you're dealing with the right kind of co companies who have a strategic interest in your uh, in your technology actually turning into a product that they can use and that they will therefore get early access to. So, so, so how many of you approach? And then, you know, and then how did it go? You know, what you know? So you actually got to speak to sixty of of the people you you approached, uh, and uh, you know, you had a meaningful conversation with with forty of them in four different countries. And from that, there's actually 10 of them that are still in discussions with you. And they're in a number of different countries. It's not like all France. And, and you know, a lot of European countries uh, have, especially the larger European countries, have a problem that the all the market discovery is done in the home country. Maybe they make some token effort in one or two other countries. Uh, but very often it's, well, we're in France. There's enough world-leading companies in France. We can sample the market based on, on France alone. And, uh, you know, it, it's it's uh, not a good look uh, to do uh, to do just that. Um, so so keep it keep a good spread. Um, and then the and, and then this question is uh, uh, how many are actually have actually committed to you in some way. And, and, you know, this is this is not untypical. If you've got a good market discovery exercise going on, these numbers from about 120 down to five. Are pretty, you know, bruising. I mean, it's it takes a lot of work to get that many conversations going, but that's kind of what you have to do, and 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 that kind of fall that let that ratio is is not not untypical. So so then let's go down to the committed. What 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 do we mean by that? So there's various levels of commitment, and you know, depending on what what. Uh, Depending on what industry you're in, or what what your particular proposition is, the nature of the commitment um, might change. But let, let's do it from let's do it from the bottom up. I mean, the the the, the holy grail really, uh, in, in many cases, is you go out and talk to a bunch of companies, and some of them say, "My God, that's amazing!" And yes, actually, I join your investment round. Uh, you know, and that's kind of like as good as it gets, as long as the terms are are, are, are reasonable, and, and it is possible, and it is possible to do to get reasonable terms. By the way. In corporate investors, even though many people think you can't, uh, but now that's very rare. And most of the sort of early adopter corporates that might be dealing with you actually won't invest or can't invest in the seed stage. You, but the best you'll get out of them is that they'll say, "Okay, you bring it to this later stage, and then we will invest." But that's pretty good, you know. If you get if you if you get some of your early adopters who are who have a a, 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 a serious plan or intent to invest in you, and they can be clear. You know, as to what are the achievable steps that you need to go through to, to get to, to get to that stage. The next kind of second best is well, you know, people say, "Oh, I really, I really like what you're doing. You're pre-product, but we'll actually, in order to help you bring this into being, we'll actually give you make an advanced purchase." And, and that's very rare as well, and, and it's hard to get. But what is much more achievable, and it is absolutely worth going for, is that the people will pay you for some kind of trial or some sort of pilot of the technology and this is about you coming up with a proposition to them that makes very clear that you know you have a strategic a breakthrough that is uh, which can result in a product which would be strategic to them and uh, there is a lot of big companies out there and many of you don't realize this there's a lot of big companies out there that to you from the outside might look like kind of impenetrable or golly, you know, we couldn't possibly begin talking to that big company. But very often, the big companies are the most approachable because a lot of them have a function in the company that is specifically tasked with scouting for uh, relevant research and stuff that is strategic to them. So there's very often uh, an open door in a lot of these companies for, for appropriate stuff uh, uh, to come into them. And, and an awful lot of them have a well, uh, you know, they're well used to paying for stuff re really early on. So you just need to go to them with the right proposition. And, and, you know, and again, from an investor point of view, um, you know, expecting an investor to entirely fund what you're doing 
uh, without you having made a serious effort to get money out of early adopter customers is not really credible. Uh, there are investors who will invest, but if you want really smart investors, they will go looking for this kind of uh, commitment. Now, the other thing that you can seek, I mean, you know, very often, uh, the, you know, your trial, or you know, if it's a, if it, you know, if you're going into animal trials or clinical trials with with a life sciences thing, uh, you know, some of those steps can be very expensive, and very often there are companies that can provide facilities or in other ways invest in kind in your trial activity or if you're an industrial thing they may you know agree to allow you to uh, trial something on a live site which will have a real cost to them so you know uh, so so showing that certain people were actually willing to uh, uh, you know make that kind of investment in kind is is also evidence and um and some of them will be very clear they'll say look you know uh we're really into what you're doing. You're too early for us. Come back to those, us at this next stage and we will engage. So even being able to have a set of people who are at that sort of next stage, they won't engage with you now, but they're clearly interested and they're, you know, they, and they're able to, to be clear as to what you need to have achieved before they will engage. That's very valuable uh, uh, too. Um uh, and then, and we'll do a free trial, you know, free trials. I mean, I'm sure you've heard this, like free stuff is valueless, you know, for, for, for a good reason. Or letters of intent or memorandums of understanding, that kind of stuff. It's just laughably easy to get those things. Uh, so I don't really have much respect for them. And most investors don't have much respect for them, for, uh, much respect for them either. So, so this really, you know, th th this is, uh, this is the real dashboard. Like the, this set of cells here, is like, you know, I've got, so you've got your pitch deck, here's my great science, this is the problem I'm solving and so on. And you get to this, you know, say, and people can say, wow, you know, uh, okay, right, there's people seriously, now this isn't particularly good, but I mean, this is, this is, you know, the, the set of kind of things that you need, you, that you need to be, that you need to work towards being able to show. So then, so you say, okay, so that's your, that's my presentation. That's fine. That's the, that's the key uh, data now. Now, and that's just you pitching it to some investor. You know, that's just you saying it. But then, this is the real kind of sneaky part: um, is are you able to populate this part? So, in other words, uh, are you able to tell the investor? And by the way, you know, uh, you know, Alcatel and or whoever, uh, you know, Alcatel doesn't exist anymore. Um, you know, the, these three or four companies are actually willing to to do an, a, an investor call with you. And that's like, okay, so this is real. So this so this top part isn't bullshit. You know, there's actually people I can talk to who can corroborate this. So, so that that's powerful. And uh, then, uh, you know, and then, and the most of you will be familiar with this. If you've gone any, any, any distance in incubator, you'll be familiar with this part, which is, you know, and uh, it's kind of desk research. Uh, so I'm solving a problem. This is the size of the problem. If I get, you know, uh, so if, if if the whole world bought my stuff, then this is the huge market I have. Uh, but actually, initially, I'm gonna I'm only gonna target you know diabetes sufferers or something. Uh, therefore, my specific addressable market or what's this S S A M specific or what's the specific S? What's the S for? for? Anyway, the the market I'm gonna start out with is this smaller market. Um, <clears throat> so a lot of you will be familiar with this. And just a quick aside, let me tell you. And this is my kind of big big criticism of an awful lot of, uh, you know, things about pitch training and teaching people how to, how to pitch. They place huge emphasis on this. And this is kind of easy, and it's way, way too easy to bullshit this. You know, you could sit down and in five minutes on the internet, you know, you could have, you could, you could have got your numbers from, from this. This is really, really theoretical. And uh, whereas the stuff above it is very empirical. You know, this is uh, like... So sure, there's a lot of people down here in the target in the total addressable market, the TAM, uh, who might be in the market for it. But actually, from a sample, from my sampling of the market, these are the ones who are actually set up and said, "Okay, yes, right, okay, we we would actually like to engage with you." So this is the real kind of this is the real uh, ev this is the real evidence part that that top part. But still, you need this you need this part as well because you know there are. You know, you could like you could come up with this amazing uh, proposition, and then when you really analyze, this, when you really analyze it, you might say, well, actually, you know, ac actually, even if you got the whole market, it's not a very big market. So you actually need this need this part as well. And then there's another part, which is also quite necessary, uh, and it is to just show that actually, you know, this has been done before in some way. You know, there are other companies who have been solving a problem like this and they got very big or they're 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 getting very big. They raised a huge amount of money. 
And this is very necessary as well, because there are some markets where, excuse me, but this part isn't obvious. So for example, I have spent uh, a bunch of time on a couple of ventures looking at water purification. Tam and Sam stuff. It looks enormous. It looks fantastic. You know, the whole world, every municipality in the world spends millions uh, on, um, you know, water purification. And I mean, and there's one, I mean, I mean a shout out to uh, a great team uh, in Ireland, um, Sean and John, and they had a fantastic venture. I really, really liked it. You know, and everything stacked up and they had an early adopter customer. But when I went looking for examples, uh, and when I spoke to other investors, everybody told me, run a mile. It's a terrible business. Do not do it. And the reason it is that it is just impossible to get big. All of those companies, uh, you know, failed because they cannot sell to the different municipalities around the world. Every country is like completely national about it, or even very, very local about it. There's a terrible risk aversion. Nobody will, nobody will buy new technologies in that space. So it's a really hard place to get big. So you actually need to, you know, as well as the other things above, you need to say, oh, no, no, this is a, this is a kind of business. It is possible to get big and look, you look at these companies and, and you know, a lot of the, the data is often hard to get, but you can usually find some clue. Uh, you know, if it's, public, if it's a public company, there's a stock market value and there's a sort of annual revenue. If it's a private company, you can see how much, um, you can often see how much it's raised. So there's usually some indication. Uh, so this this is quite necessary as well. So, so everything on this slide, the things on this slide together, basically are the kind of evidence that, you know, my science can turn into a real a real business, and this is the the this is the sort of big innovation I would say in, in our in our scorecard. And this is kind of when we set up the fund originally. This is really what we probably went looking for. The other two slides, which I'm going to go on to now, are the things that we didn't expect to look to need to look for, but actually we found we really needed to. And the Innovate UK guys were great actually in helping us to, you know, prioritize some of this stuff because they found. Uh, they found, uh, and a lot of grant funders will find this, that they have a process, they look at the stuff, it looks good, they give it a big grant, and then they find it fails afterwards, and they never raise money, and the government money was wasted, and they say, well, why did that fail? And when we started working together on it, we, we actually realized that there was, you know, some things that were in our test that they could check out on, but there's some things here as well, notably around cap table. And the biggest single, the biggest single uh, cause of failure was not that the not that the cap table was was crazy, but that the team actually couldn't agree a cap table. So a whole lot of uh, science-based ventures fail because when it comes down to it, uh, you know, you're all excited about the thing, maybe, you know, two or three of you go into an incubator program, you think, oh, it's really great, you know, it's really checking out here. And then, you know, late and too late, you sit down and say, well, actually, okay, who owns the company? You know, how do we divide this up? And how much should the university own? And they do that too late and they find they can't they can't agree on. So actually just actually just forcing the discussion early to say, well, look, look are we ever going to be able to agree on a cap table it is really worth doing because, you know, if you can't do it at the beginning, you probably also won't be able to do it, you know, a year later when you spent the grant. Uh, but you, you certainly, and you may be able to get grants without agreeing this, but you certainly won't get investment without agreeing this. So it's really helpful because very often there are really fundamental misunderstandings. And, you know, you, you often need arbitration. You need the help of, of, you know, either your tech transfer guys or somebody from an incubator or some, you know, early investor. You often need help doing this because, you know, sometimes you are the uh, person, you're the postdoc who's finishing a PhD in an area, you know, you work closely with your academic uh, supervisor, and maybe it's something related to work they've been doing on for years. And maybe you think you should own most of the company because you're thinking about creating a company and going out full time with the company. But, but maybe they think they should own most of the company because they've been working on it for years. And then maybe the university says, no, hold on a second, guys. Hold on. We, we own 60% of it because you know that technically the university owns all the intellectual property. So it's really worthwhile to sit down as early as you can and, and set this set this out. And so I'll talk you through this line by line because I've kind of populated a, a sort of a typical situation here. So, uh, and what I'm, what I'm aiming to show here is... Uh, the situation after after seed investment. So 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 typically uh, at the seed stage, you will give away about twenty percent of the company. Whoever's putting in the seed money will typically take about twenty percent of the money. If you're lucky and you got lots of grants, you might you know push this down to ten percent or something like that. So so um, and I'm also assuming that you have created an option pool for 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 new hires, which you may or may not do, or you might do it at a lower level. You may just have ten percent, or maybe you you postpone postpone doing this. So if you take out these, if you take out these, this forty percent, then the discussion here is really about how is the sixty percent 
how is the remaining 60% uh, divided up? So let, let, let me talk through this uh, line by line. And, uh, and let me also give you a tip. So there will be a recording of this available. And I suspect that in many cases, there's only one member of the team here on this call, and it's probably going to be the postdoc person who's about creating the venture. And there probably is a, you know, a real full-time academic in the background, and there is a real university. So, <clears throat> so you know, when you get to the recording, and when you get to this stage, or you say, hey, you know, hey, Professor, I think we should talk about ownership. And look, I saw this great talk, and it would be really helpful if you looked at this talk before we, we had the conversation. So let me, that's just a little bit of advice. Uh, so, so the, the top person, the most important person is the person who in, intends to go out full time into the venture. Now, there's a debate as to whether the scientist should be the chief executive. In my view, they should be at the beginning because at the early stage, the sort of pre-seed stage is still about technical delivery. You, you know, and you may, somebody or an investor, somebody might say you need a new CEO later on. But I can tell you it's next to impossible to get a new CEO into a kind of a really, really early stage uh, startup. And in my view, it's not necessary anyway. Um, so, so the most important person is the person who's going to come from the scientific team and go in full time to run to run the venture. Um, they may be called CEO, interim CEO, or CEO slash CTO, so, so, something like that. Uh, and they must be technically credible. So, you know, they really need to have come from the team that has created the 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 um, the, the, the intellectual property because they're going to be the kind of front person for it. Um, and they're the person who who needs to be re rewarded most and have the biggest you know single single amount of shares, um, and they also crucially must be committing to the venture one hundred percent full time. Like this, you know, you're you're really not fifty percent, even seventy five percent is shaky. You know, when talking to investors, it's got to be there's got to be somebody who is actually really running this 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 venture. Very often there is also a kind of an academic supervisor type person, maybe somebody who's been working on this, you know, with you for a long time. And I'm 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 guessing most of you are the sort of an inventor person on this call. So let's 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 assume that. So you may also have a, a supervisor who is a full time, a tenured academic, right? Now tenured academics are a big like boop, 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 uh, for 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 investors. It's like oh my god, here comes the tenured academic looking for me to give money so that they can get sort of create this company uh you know without them doing much while they're drawing their university salary and so on so uh, uh, so like and, and i and i've seen this a whole bunch of times uh so the tenured academics are kind of like alarm bells you, you know uh and when 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 a tenured academic comes doing the pitch it's a disaster you've got to it's got to be an inventor who's coming along saying look you know, I want to create this company uh, based on based on this in, this intellectual property. However, normally the uh, tenured academic has a lot to add. Uh, you know, they they have uh, you know they're older, wiser, or whatever. They may have a reasonable claim on the background IP, and crucially, they very often are willing to spend a significant amount of time, at least in the early couple of years. They're willing to make a time commitment, a specific time commitment uh, to the venture. Now. It is also a persistent problem that tenured academics apply for grants here and there and all kinds of stuff. And then in every grant, they're saying it's going to be 50% of my time, 20% of my time. And, and there's actually, you know, they become sort of money or what's the word? A, a great man for one man is an, an expression in Ireland. Uh, but from an investor point of view, if I see 25% on the on, on, on this, I go looking for university. I go looking for a commitment from the university that says, yes. You know, we agree formally that Professor Mulfresh is available one day per week for, for, for this venture. And that's actually quite hard to get. And when you make clear that you're insisting on that, very often the person says, well, actually, oh, actually, no, no, no. OK, I'm not available 25 percent. It's only about 10 percent. And then therefore their claim on equity actually goes down. So 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 this is a kind of a very important uh, uh, set of things here. You know, what is your claim? What's your percentage time commitment, and is that backed up by is that backed up by a sort of commitment from the university that you are actually available uh, to, to that extent? And and I, I labour it here a little bit because it's a really big problem, right? What what's really common is that the full time academic thinks they should own the vast majority of the the, the shares, and the person who's going to full time and should own a lot less than them. That's a really big problem, or it's a really common situation, and it's a problem because nobody will fund the venture. Then you know you say like forget about it. Um, 
Now you may, uh, you know, have you may say, okay, right, we're going to we're, like at the post seed, uh, uh, sorry, after the seed stage, we're going to hire a salesperson. They're going to be on the team. We're not doing it yet. There, that person, of course, is going to be one hundred percent. But we're not doing it just yet. It's somebody we're going to hire uh, after the uh, after the after the. Or sorry, sorry, no, no, no. What I mean is, sorry, what I'm saying here is, what I'm saying here is. Uh, this is the situation now. We're fundraising, right? This is the situation right now. We're, we're fundraising for the company, and the only people working full time on it are Anna Inventor, and we've got this business advisor person who's working with me uh, part time. But but when we do raise the seed money, this is this is this is what we're going to have. So normally you can't expect too many people to be working, you know, a substantial amount of time before you get funding. But you have to have a strong, you know, say, okay, when we raise funding, we're actually going to hire a full time salesperson. Uh, you know, Professor Mulfresh is going to be available 25% of the time and the advisor is going to continue to be available 5% of the time. So you actually need to, so so what's really common in, uh, in investor decks that I see from science-based ventures is it'll say, here I am, I'm an inventor and I've got Guillaume Bertelut, who's a great guy, but he works in Deep Tech Founders. He's not in my venture, you know, and I've got the tech transfer person from my university, also on the team. And of course, like they're kind of helping you, but but I know immediately like you're all you're doing is just putting extra heads on it. And then I've got you know Professor Professor Mulfresh, and I know I, I, I quickly find out that's a tenured academic. So I know they're not on your team either. And then maybe you've got the been around the block uh, advisor person. So uh so the intention of this table is to flush that out and and you know say, okay, well, look, you know, who is really involved, you know, and to what extent and how much are they going to own? And then, and then another little test here. So a, a critical thing is what is the university's stake? Now, uh, so what I'm showing here is the situation after some dilution. Uh, so uh, after 20%, so uh, yes, actually that should be slightly higher or slightly lower if you took 40, if, if, if you if you diluted with the with these with these two things. But so <clears throat> so a typical so if a university, for example, was looking for 20%, um, uh, and, uh, and you know, universities will look for something in the range 10 to 30%. And anything like anything higher than 20% is difficult. From an investor point of view, it's like that's a very high, you know, but but it, it happens. But if they if they were looking for 20%, then typically as soon as you take a seed investor in, they get diluted. So if a seed investor took 20%, then the university would go down to you know 16 or 17 or whatever the calculation is there. Um uh, but the important number uh, that I have highlighted here, and it's a real red flag for investors, is how much of the company is owned by the university uh, and by uh, full-time full-time academics. And if this number is any way high, I would say 37% even is, is quite high, then that's a bit of a red flag. Because the problem is that many of your ventures will need to raise a lot of money over several rounds. And you know, a lot of deep tech ventures need 5, 10, 20 million uh, you know, before they're going to get before they get your product, and that's going to represent each of those steps is going to represent a twenty percent dilution of the the venture. And so, if the person, if Anna Inventor and like the team who are actually running the company are starting with too small a percentage, and they get pushed down to some tiny percentage, then from an investor point of view, you're saying, "Well, hold on, I'm not going to invest in I'm not going to invest in that company." At one second, one second, slight interruption here. So my daughter's home. It's very important piece of information for you all to know at this time. <clears throat> um, so, uh, uh, so if if you're starting out, if the team who's running the venture is starting out with too small a percentage, then investors will look and say, "Well, hold on a second, guys. You know, um, you know, like when you get to raise twenty million, or you're someone is looking, considering putting twenty million into the company, and they're thinking that an inventor at that stage is going to be down to the sort of Five, four, five, six percent, or something. Then, like you know, it's just it's just wrong. There's going to be so much friction. There's going to be so much resentment to the fact that the university still got this big stake that they just walk away. Now, you could say, you know, if you're a really interested investor, you could say, okay, you know, Anna, I'm going to help you renegotiate this with the university because it isn't it isn't viable. But honestly, there are better things. You don't have time as an investor. You're kind of looking for stuff that is oven ready. You know, it's all this has been figured out. And when, when when you come along and you see a cap table and the university and the tenured academics have a really high high share, you say, look, guys, sort that out. I don't have time to sort that out for you. 
so you really disadvantage yourself if you get the cap table uh, wrong. And uh, and the you know the thing that that, that has been learned is that. <clears throat> If you haven't had the conversation at all, if you haven't agreed a cap table, then you're you're completely screwed. I mean, no, like, like if you if you can't do it now, you're also probably it's actually you're actually less likely to do it successfully in a year's time because there will be a perception of greater value and there may be a sort of a bigger a bigger fight about it. So this is really uh, the, the cap table is uh, really important to get right. Okay, and you know by all means you won't be doing it yet, but but come back to this. Seek out this recording in a year's time or whenever it is you're, you're doing it, uh, and uh, you know just and as I say, sit down and watch it with your with your university tech transfer guy or with your uh, your um, uh, you know with with your academics and, and 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 again and the thing that I say to you is but Anna you know I don't know why you're telling me this because BPI are quite happy to fund this this venture even with the cap table they funded the last few things we spun out where we owned thirty percent of it and what you can tell them you know uh, I can tell them if they're watching now if it's just this is a year's time Anna sorry uh, look BPI might fund it but a serious investor at the next stage will not fund it at all so you're wasting your time so that's really that's really my message here this is really important. Now, the next part is around the IP. Uh, and again, line by line, let's go through this. So freedom to operate, you know, uh, you got this great idea. Is it actually, are you actually allowed to do that? Now, if any of you, if any of you have been through a patenting process already or have had patents applied for, then that's okay. You've probably passed this test already. Normally the university will check for freedom to operate before it goes by, by patenting. But essentially this is, you know, has anyone else got your big idea already? Uh, you know, or would you be in breach of some existing patents or, or something else? So that that's really fundamental, and you certainly daren't go near any investor before you've 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 checked that out pretty fully. The next one then is, uh, you know, what formal IP exists, and and you know, people ask me regularly, what do you mean by deep tech? You know, uh, what what is that? And 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 deep tech uh, means that. We're talking about ventures where there is something already developed. It's not an idea. It's not somebody coming and saying, I'm going to create the next Airbnb for dogs. You know, uh, I've mocked on some little site here and we'll develop, you know, when we get some money, we'll develop something fancier. But it's basically those things are a lot of software ventures are basically ideas that have been partly developed with uh Deep tech ventures, typically it is, I've been working on this in the lab for years, and finally we have this breakthrough. We have something amazing here that nobody else is able to do. You know, we have uh, uh, we have a gun that we're going to bring to a knife fight. We're going to have an unfair advantage in the market because we have, you know, achieved this amazing tensile strength, you know, sort of four times or ten times better than anybody out there has, has already got. And we have a patent on it. You know, uh, or, or it's trade secrets. You know, nobody else can find out what, what we're doing. What we're doing. So the question here is, like what is that uh, defensible intellectual property that you have? And this is kind of like table stakes, uh, if you use a poker analogy, uh, <clears throat> in deep tech. You know, there's got to be something already existing. Like the, uh, you know, the, the serious uh, specialist investors are, are ourselves are, are not invent. We're not uh, investing in ideas. We're investing on the commercial. We're investing in the commercialization of stuff that has already been invented. Now, there's normally a lot of extra work to do to actually commercialize or productize it, but essentially you've got to have, have some significant claim to begin with. And then and then if you have such a claim, like what is the formal manifestation of that? Is it a patent? Is it in software? Is it you know trade secrets or whatever? Uh, then who owns it? Now, this varies country by country. Uh, in many cases, the university owns it. Uh, you know, uh, or if you're an undergraduate, hopefully you won't. Uh, you know, there's various different situations. Or you've created a company and, and that, that spin-out company owns it. Or in some cases, you own it personally. But, you know, it's 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 important to be clear about that. And then what's the licensing offer? So assuming you do not own it or your spin-out company does not own it, which is the usual situation for things coming out of research organizations, then what is the university offering? And, and again, like, you know, uh, this is a sort of, this is from uh, from a lesson hard learned, you know, being you know at, at this for for a while now. Like uh, early on, I would go really far with ventures, and we had a great, this great big exciting discussion about you know what what's uh, about um, you know what 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 they're going to do, and then you discover actually. Uh, you know that the university owns the uh, university owns the intellectual property, and the university has a terrible terms for spin out. Like it's really unviable. So it's really important. So the idea here is to is to uh, the idea is kind of 
b- before the investor goes asking hard questions and which potentially are very disappointing answers, it is essentially putting the answers out here so that they can immediately see what the situation is. So, 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 so who owns the who owns the IP? It's usually university. And then what is the offer? What is the so usually, and you know, many of you will not have got to this stage yet. The, the normal situation is that you create some sort of spin-out company and you do a license with the university. The university will normally not assign the intellectual property to the company. Even if it's spinning it out and even if it's taking an equity stake, they don't normally hand over the intellectual property completely to the uh, spin-out venture because the spin-out venture might fail. And so what they're always afraid of is that they spend millions of public money developing something uh, you know, or pay, paying for the development of something, and then they license it to some little hopeless spin-out, which then fails in the first year, and then some, you know, uh, foreign government or uh, company buys the uh, company for, you know, uh, one thousand uh, euro or ten thousand euro, uh, and and therefore gets access to this thing that the French government has spent millions on. So so normally they license and they won't assign the. Uh, IP to the company until a little bit later on, until it has proven that the company basically can survive. But the question is, what is the licensing offer? And normally what you're looking for is some sort of exclusive license, it's essentially, which, you know, which is essentially saying that, you know, m- my new company, uh, you know, uh, Deep Tech uh, SA, uh, is going to be the only company that is allowed to uh, c- commercialize this, the, the exclusive. Sometimes it's limited. Like ideally you want exclusive in, in all fields, but there are many pieces of intellectual property which have many different applications. You at least want, you know, uh, the, you at least want an exclusive license for the fields that you're going to, uh, to you're going to uh, do, do the commercialization in. Uh, then uh, what are the what are the royalties? So a lot of universities will expect to get some license revenue from your, from your company, and if you've got to, and, and sometimes universities are completely unreasonable about this, and they have crazy high expectations as to royalties, uh, uh, and uh, so it's important to just get that out there. Again, it's a hard question, and you know, again, uh, you know, it's also it's also help, and I can just just. Uh, just one point about this and about the just one point about this and about the whole like this whole this whole page here you may go to your university and you may say to them look you know I, I, this crazy irish guy said we should populate all this stuff you know because we're just doing our spin out and the university will often give you the standard answer for all of this all of this stuff they'll give you this well we always expect 30% or you know whatever it is or uh, and we always expect you know to get 10% uh, royalty revenue from from everything you get uh, forever uh, and no, we won't give you exclusive license. And so, so you can populate this based on what the university said. And then you can go to any significant investor, uh, you know, and you can say, hey, what do you think of this? And then I say, well, look, you need, you need to go back to the university and understand that everything is negotiable. Almost all of this is negotiable with your university. And, you know, and most of the universities also know that if they're being asked to put it out in a really sort of a kind of baldly like this if they're if they're being asked to just put it out that they know that they'll be found out and so you'll end up getting a sort of better initial offer from the university by by forcing them to expose all the key terms and then you may need to go back to them after you discuss with the first investor when the first investor says look you know forget about it come back to me when this is in a reasonable shape and you say what was that guy pierce called his head again and and so you need to kind of you, you know and, and um so, so you need to get this in, in, into reasonable shape and then finally uh, last part is assignment you know, in general, for intellectual property-based ventures, you want the uh, intellectual property to be owned by your your company. Sometimes it's it's okay to have exclusive licenses, but you know, ultimately, if you want your venture to be acquired, uh, they will be acquiring the intellectual property. So you want that intellectual property assigned to your company. And and as I said earlier, uh, most universities or research organizations won't assign it immediately, but they'll very often have a conditional. Uh, agreement to say as soon as you've raised over a million euro we'll assign it or as soon as your revenue has gone over a million euro or something like that they'll assign it so so it's but it's important to get the conditionality of that you know agreed it's not a case of come back to us maybe we might talk to you in a year's time or they because they could really you know mess you around if it's if if, if it's not specified so that's the, that that's the team cap and i i peace table now this next one will not take long it's much simpler but it's uh <clears throat> quite important too and uh so <clears throat> so first of all where are you at today so you know just just a simple description so you you've got through the slides you say this cool thing we're going to do like what level of 
technology readiness level is, is that at? And read up on technology readiness levels if you're not familiar with them, because it's it's a language a lot of investors, you know, deep tech investors w- w- will use, uh, you know, to just get an idea of how how are, are you, is it an idea, is it in the lab, is it sort of, you know, industrially proven, where are you about? Then, <clears throat> then you're saying, okay, look, we're actually going out looking funding for funding now to do X, Y, Z, you know, and maybe it's, you know, we've, we've, we're at the stage today, we've proven it at gram scale, we want to prove it at kilogram scale. That's what we're looking for money for. So you need to kind of come up with some very simple description of what it is you're looking for money for from, from a technology point of view. We've, we've done lab trials, we want to do animal trials. You know, that's what we need funding for. Uh, so, and then when we have that done, we will be up at TRL 7. And then here's a really kind of sneaky question. Um, and, and but it's and I just explain the importance of it. Uh, so very often, it's like shockingly often, uh, people go out and they raise money and they have a pitch deck and they say what they're going to do and they maybe they speak to some customers and then they get the money and they go off and do something that is actually not of interest to the customers. You know, they didn't really ask the customers what what is it we need to do. You know, like as you've seen, we've proven it at gram scale. What is it that you need us to do before you will make a significant commitment to our venture or a higher level of commitment uh, uh, to to the venture? So you need to basically be very well aligned with your interested customers in regard to how you spend the money. And the question here is: if I, as an investor, go to the three or four early adopters that you told me are really interested, in, and I say to them, "What the guys have said they want to do is go from." Proving it at gram scale to kilogram scale. Is that the thing you want them to do? Is that the thing that will allow you to, to make that investment or you know make that pre-purchase? Uh, and so, like the question is, how many of the how many of the reference customers that you're citing actually understand that and agree with what it is you've said you're going to use the money? And, and like that's that's surprisingly important. And it's surprising how many people get that wrong. They go and spend the money. And then they're actually no further along because they didn't really do what the market expected them to do in terms of proving the technology. Okay, and then finally, uh, so how much do we need? To do that, we need half a million euro to do that, okay? Now, we've worked out that we can get uh, grants of 150 grand to, to do it. Uh, some of the early adopters, one of the early adopters is going to pay us 20 grand for a pilot, which is good. It's better than nothing. It's not, it's not, not great. It'd be nice to, nicer to have a much higher ratio of funds needed to how much is coming from customers but there's something at least um the university seed fund who's kind of like a bit soft they invest in everything that comes out of our university pretty much they'll give us 50 50 grand and we've already from my cousin and my uncle are going to give me you know 50 grand each uh so i've got 100 grand so actually all we're looking for from you investor is 180 so and, and the investor look at this can say okay right so that's not bad right so you're only looking for 180 from us you've actually sourced quite a lot of the funds already uh you've got this one is the real key one like how much have you got from your early adopter customers but it's it's really helpful to see this set out so what what is really common is for people to say i need a million you know i need a million i'm talking to you mr private investor and please give me a million and i can just tell you that the private investors are the hardest people to get money from uh, you know, the, 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 they are typically looking for a commercial return. It's not, you know, uh, and even if they have a, even if they're theme based like environmental, whatever, they still, in most cases, you know, have a discipline where they expect you to sort of show that it's going to be a commercial venture. Uh, so the more money you can get from the people who it's easy to get money from, the better. And it also looks much better to the private investors when they're saying, okay, well, well, these guys we're we're, put, we're only putting in 180 out of 500 like when we put in the 180 these guys are going to have 500 uh, in cash uh, which is pretty good so so uh, and summarizing it in this way here's what we need the money for the market agrees that that this will be good use of the money and by the way we've got a lot of the money from elsewhere and crucially we've got some of it from those early adopters like that is honest to god this slide would save so many conversations and you know, populating this in a, in, a, in the right way uh, will make you look so much better. So that's it. Uh, you know, for many of you, this will be a little you're you're you're, you're er, earlier than you need to do all this. Uh, but I can tell you, come back to this, uh, and and like this is the you know this is the kind of gold gold standard. Like this is you're thinking, how am I going to? What do I need to do to populate this? Uh, you know, uh, to populate this part. That's really got to be your objective and, and the focus of everything you do. Everything else, you know, is is tangential. It's all about you're in the business of commercialization, creating a startup. How do you actually get to a stage where there's useful numbers in this table? That's really the focus. And that's my presentation. Thank you. Questions?